last area, especially in the Gray Bruce area. Oh, I'm up. Okay, thank you. So um, today we're going to quickly discuss with you the healthcare consent and advanced care planning, in particular, your role as healthcare providers. So we are members of the Hospice Bit of Care community of practice, and specifically a healthcare consent and advanced care planning community of practice. Our past activities include reviewing national materials, inputting into several uh, provincial planning documents, creation of Ontario-specific Speak Up workbook, and educational presentations and accompanying facilitator guides. We will be sharing just parts of today's um, session with you, the condensed version of the education uh, that is geared to the healthcare provider. There are longer versions that include some activities, and those are all on, um, they all come with a facilitator's guide, and they're all on uh, our website, as well as the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association in the Ontario version. So the goals for the healthcare consent and advanced care planning community of practice are to create opportunities to influence policy and stream issues related to healthcare consent and advanced care planning, to enhance awareness and understanding of healthcare consent and advanced care planning with an Ontario specific perception. Uh, and that includes creating materials such as these PowerPoints that uh, I have spoken about. Uh, and we want to create an active and engaged community of practice in advancing goals and providing leadership, leading uh, healthcare consent and advanced care planning. So the format that you'll see in all of the PowerPoints is similar. Uh, the first slide in each of them has notes about the presentations, especially for the facilitator, to guide you with what materials that you might need to read uh, in order to deliver the information and for your ease in uh, answering and fielding questions. The intent of this presentation for the healthcare providers is to promote an understanding of healthcare consent, to review terms and concepts, to review healthcare uh, provider role, healthcare, and promoting advanced care planning, and to also share resources. So, given that we have a short time frame, I'm going to get Liz to do the next part. And I don't know whether that's because I'm a speed talker or um, I've uh, used these materials in a number of ways when we were piloting and trialing them out. So this isn't about a particular research project. This is, is a putting together an educational materials that relates to research, to the law, um, to the issues that we're seeing out there in terms of understanding healthcare consent and advanced care planning. So. Um, we start with, um, and I just had to be sure what was up there, we basically start the conversation with stressing the importance and we do focus in on, on uh, professional practice responsibility and the fact that this is the law uh, in terms of what we're expected to do. Throughout the presentation, we focus in on um, key terms and concepts such as uh, consent uh, to start with and that what our role is as healthcare providers is quite clearly outlined, that we have to get consent to refusal of consent in Ontario from a person. So that person um, who, whom is capable or the substitute decision maker or makers if they're uh, determined not to be capable. And consent in the, in the context relates to withholding treatment, uh, providing treatment, uh, withdrawing treatment. The um, important elements of consent, uh, uh, there's four sort of pillars and that's that it must relate to the specific treatment that's being proposed or the, or the care plan. Um, it has to be informed. It must be obtained um, or given voluntarily and it must uh, not be obtained through that misrepresentation or fraud. So no overstating the, the issue, no understating the issue, no gearing people to you know, some of the side effects and not others, and no persistent insistence that science uh, above all uh, is the way to make a decision. So this is the depth of information that is to be provided to get informed consent. 
and uh, decisions require con uh, the de decisions require consent, and so we're also required to help the person understand the context of making that decision, right? So they, so you have to have the context of what is the person's particular uh, health condition or status uh, in terms of uh, needing to make and and sharing this level of information. The information we provide has to be understood. Um, we need to allow an opportunity for people to receive answers to any of their questions or inquiries. And we need to think about um, the reasonable person standard, which we spend more time defining um, uh, in the particular sessions. But what would a reasonable person need to, uh, need to make that decision? We know that consent must relate to a current health condition. But we can develop a care plan or a plan of treatment um, for future care if it relates to that current health condition. And that is still consent, and that is not a process of advanced care planning. That is getting consent for a plan of treatment or, uh, or a care plan. A good example of that would be somebody with ALS. Um, we know that ventilation is going to become an, uh, an, an issue, and you will um, begin those discussions early prior to it being an issue for folks, and, and uh, they can give consent uh, for it to happen or not happen or, or to withdraw it after a trial period or, or whatever is in the, in the plan. <coughs> Um, people, yes, the short answer to the question is yes. You know, people are entitled to say no. Uh, and our role really is to help people understand and appreciate the decision at hand. And that's the role that we have as healthcare providers. The concept of uh, capacity is really important for people to understand uh, when, you're, when you're looking at informed consent. And in, in essence, it really, our opinion doesn't count as to the rightness or wrongness of, of what a person's decision is. Um, it is about the quality of understanding and appreciating that goes into making the decision. And the same concepts about capacity uh, apply to both children and adults. There's no age uh, attached to it. Um, capacity is also not dependent on a test result or, or a diagnosis necessarily. It, and again, it's based on the context and the complexity of the decision that, that is at hand and the situation. And it is a legal definition and not an, uh, a medical definition. So we consider a person uh, capable when uh, he or she is able to understand the information and that uh, they can appreci the, uh, appreciate the consequences of, of the decision that they're, that they're making. And it's our responsibility as healthcare providers to act, um, who are offering the treatment or, or a plan of treatment to determine capacity in our interactions. Um, we spend some time talking about how capacity is a is really a moving target. You know, for some people, it fluctuates for time of day, you know, morning to night. For some people, it fluctuates depending upon where they're at in a treatment regime. Um, it may fluctuate depending on their condition. Um, for people, uh, the complexity of the decision. You know, some people can decide what to eat and what to wear and what activities to participate in, but they may not be able to make a decision about uh, a particular uh, treatment that's being um, offered. And we can't make assumptions about capacity based on diagnosis, a developmental delay, someone with a, with, um, a psychiatric condition, somebody with Alzheimer's. This will depend on the stage and, and where folks are at. We also spend some time in an exchange during, uh, we suggest in, and, um, in the presentations to talk about and ask the question about, so how do you do that? How do you do that in your day-to-day -day practice in terms of determining capacity? We then focus on how we determine who the substitute decision maker is. And in, in Ontario, the law clearly outlines, um, um, uh, Sorry, my, my sentence is mixed up here in writing. But it clearly outlines who is the substitute decision maker using that, that uh, ranked list of legal priority of uh, whom one should be talking to when the person is considered not capable. So this is the hierarchy, and I won't walk through all of the, um, um, the rankings. Um, but the second person on the list, you'll note, is the person who's named in a power of attorney for personal care document. So the power of attorney for personal care document, um, it, it is a document, and the person named is a substitute decision maker. And so some of what we do throughout our, our educational presentations is to be a little bit relentless and persistent about our language. So I, we sometimes will hear POA as a term that people used. That person is actually the substitute decision maker, and the power of attorney is a document. Um, 
we reinforce throughout the role of the hierarchy in determining so who's at equal ranking at a particular level such as brothers or sisters or children uh, it's not who lives the closest who's the nicest who's who visits most often um, in if uh, if it's under the substitute if it's uh, on the hierarchy and someone hasn't named somebody um, and we just um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so we talk about what the role is and, and uh, in, in greater detail as well. And so how do we do that? So how do we inquire about, uh, about people's goals and their values and their beliefs and spend, spend time with them? Um, we can uh, help to clarify the understanding of somebody's particular health condition and diagnosis. We can provide information verbally, you know, in writing and in many other forms uh, uh, for people. Um, we can discuss prognosis, look at um, treatment and care outcomes, and again, that depth of information that you're required to provide in terms of proposed treatments, you know, the nature, benefits, risks, uh, side effects, alternative courses of action, um, consequences of not uh, having the treatment, and answer any questions. So basically what we're saying is you, we need to follow the law that guides us uh, in terms of what our role is. Essentially, um, advanced care planning uh, is a process of communication about future health care wishes. And it may also involve that, that consideration of who's going to speak on your behalf. But we'd like to also know, we spend time talking about um, uh, the terms that we've adopted in common language here in Ontario are advanced care planning, advanced directives, uh, living wills, and you won't find any of those terms actually reflected in any law or legislation in Ontario, but we have embedded it in our common language. Um, and they, it, they generally come from other jurisdictions, uh, the U.S. and other provinces uh, potentially, when we're using those terms. We share some of the research findings, uh, in, and to sum up that slide, basically um, what research is showing when people engage in conversations about their future wishes is that it uh, decreases stress and anxiety levels. It um, allows people a greater sense of satisfaction with their care, along with they actually rate their sense of quality of life and death uh, more positively. Um, they also show that, that people's wishes or values or belief are more likely to be followed or respected in their future health care. In Ontario, and that's, this is totally about uh, Ontario, um, expression of future health care wishes. Um, we can write them, we can just say them, you can use bliss boards, uh, um, pick symbols, whatever your communication method is, um, that's how you can express your wishes. And there is in Ontario no specific written format uh, legally to express your wishes. Um, and it's important though to understand that the only way that you can appoint someone or name someone that you would like or uh, to be your substitute decision maker or makers is through that power of attorney for personal care uh, documentation process. <clears throat> Excuse me. So again, we review throughout. Um, consent is, you know, again, I'm talking about um, agreeing to withholding or withdrawing. And we have to get informed consent for a particular treatment. And wishes, that's that speculation and that what if, please, uh, what if piece. Uh, level of care form, it's been touched upon. It's a very common uh, practice out there, but misguided and misinformed. It doesn't relate to a person's individual uh, specific health conditions, so it lacks that specificity and detail to be considered consent. Um, it also doesn't require then in its broad base uh, the disclosure of burdens and benefits and risks and, and all those things that we are to provide. And so it's a, it's a real pitfall to consider them any kind of legal document and they give a false sense of assurance that somehow consent has been obtained. Um, it also falsely assures a healthcare provider that uh, a particular treatment would not be wanted because a particular level is given. So sometimes ap appropriate discussions and interventions are not offered or talked about. And then the other thing that's out there is that they're interpreted differently in different levels um, across many uh, organizations. So our role in terms of those um, conversations and those future wishes, it's really about um, um, I'm actually skipping forward. Uh, 
it, our role is really about promoting the process, right, and promoting communication and educating about what's a power of attorney, what's the hierarchy, um, uh, providing health and treatment information, providing context about Ontario and what it means, and that we reiterate that it really is a process. It's really about communication. That's what it's about when people engage in communication of wishes that we commonly refer to as advanced care planning. And it might be about appointing a substitute decision maker. We'd like to reinforce that it's not a form and a tick, a tick or a tick box or a tax to be completed, and then that is it, that it is done. Um, and so, Carol, do you want to? Yeah. She's going to whip through. Yeah, I know we're really short of time. So I'm just going to stress with you that when you're looking at resources, if you could try and look at them with Ontario uh, mindset, because our laws are different in Ontario than they are in BC or other provinces. So in order to meet your obligations, you need to have Ontario specific focused things. Um, there are a number of resources that are wonderful. Uh, the Advocacy Centre for the Elderly has a lot of tips and uh, things on it. Um, when we're looking at specific things for us, for those of us who are nurses, there's the College of Nurses, there's social workers, the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Um, NICE has a really good consent and capacity uh, brochure. If you want to look at it, you can come up after. Um, Ontario Guide to Advanced Care Planning. Power of Attorney Kit, uh, and the CCOP Ontario specific um, workbook Liz has got there. And there are lots of uh, research articles as well. So just in summary, uh, we want to make sure that uh, our goals for these educations are cre created promoting the um, understanding of healthcare consent as it pertains to advanced care planning. And I think we're out of time. So I'll leave it at that. Is it?